five, four, three, two. What makes you say that? Hello, friends. Welcome to What Makes You Say That. This is episode three. My name is Brian Williams, and I am happy to be joined once again by my esteemed colleague and the best dressed guy I know, Mr. John Kerr. How's it going for you today, John? Hey, hey, all good, all good. I'm, and I'm glad you referenced fashion. <laughs> Around here, we like to warm up before the big game. So, are you ready for this week's warm up question? I'm ready. All right. Thinking back to when. You laughed the hardest in the school. What was happening and what made it so funny? <laughs> well, there have been a few, a few times when I've laughed hardest. Um, and strangely enough, I think my top three all involve you. <laughs> <laughs> well, give us one. <laughs> I, I do recall a uh, Spirit Week little put, uh, activity put together by the prefects that involved some sumo suits. <laughs> and uh, you, you went that. in pretty confident. And um, <laughs> back in the day when Mr. Kermisu was here, oh, it didn't dear. end well and it ended quickly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I did, I did laugh pretty hard. That, that, I think that was one of, one of the, I mean, when I'm not laughing at myself, strangely enough, I'm probably laughing at you. <laughs> I, I, I absolutely. I do remember the sumo. That's a good curveball. I went flying. It was not. It was yeah. It, I it was quick. It was. I, I think uh, it was in in the actual trajectory of flight that <laughs> I had to hold my stomach. <laughs> All right. Yes. Thanks. Well, that's that's that that's what I was hoping for. I was hoping that you'd come up with one that I that I wasn't thinking about uh, again. The doll assembly is coming up. Uh, not in this episode, but we will get through that. Uh, we have an amazing episode planned for you today, including a visit to middle school. We've got advice for parents who are teaching from home, BH staff trivia, discussion with Director of Innovation and Technology, Ms. Lois McGill, and so much more. But the episodes don't ever really start until we hear that quote. Well, this one comes, uh, I'm keeping a journal, and I just label it day by day, as some of you know, and this one comes from the fifth day. And it's by uh, Roberto Calasso, who's an Italian author. Uh, he's been described as a literary, a literary institution of one. And he said, there is nothing more alive than absence. Interesting. Thank you very much. Well, we have survived another week in isolation and uh, practicing social distancing. So, John, what's new this week? Give us something that was different from the last few weeks. Well, actually, it's my uh, my kids who've been exploring the neighborhood on their bikes uh, as they get outside for their daily exercise. And uh, they took us through. I live in Island Lakes, and there's some new neighborhoods going up uh, around us, and and it's amazing uh, when you when you can get out there and see uh, how much how much is actually still going on. But the the funny part was that I expanded Mila's geographical exploration area. <laughs> While well, you're teaching, right? she's learning. I think pretty soon one of our check in questions will be not how are you self isolating, but how are you managing to self isolate from your family members. <laughs> Uh, and <laughs> we've had the experience where Christine and I have been able to go for a walk without the kids and the kids have been able to kind of ride around the neighborhood independently. But as, as a parent, I, I get this, this is a new experience for me because I'm really happy that the kids are out of the house for 10 minutes. And <laughs> once that feeling goes away though, it's just filled with worry about when they're coming back. So <laughs> I can't imagine what it's going to be like in the future when it's not a half an hour you know, outing it when she's gone out at eight o'clock and says she'll be back around midnight. And, and I'm, I'm sure the first 20 minutes are really good, but the next three and a half hours <laughs> going to be pretty <laughs> tough to deal with. How about yeah. you? How's McKinley coping? Well, you know, she's, um, when she has a plan, everything is a negotiation though. She's going to be, she's going to be a chief negotiator or a lawyer or something. Everything. I have to, basically trick her into doing something on her own while I get something done. Once she's into it, she's into it. And it's great. She can do hundred piece puzzles and, and things like that, but it's just getting started. It takes almost a miracle. And I have to find a way to outthink her, which it doesn't always happen. We've also discovered a new sport on our walks. 
maybe not a sport, but a game. And I think everyone's playing with us. They just don't know it. And it's called, <laughs> it's called sidewalk chicken. It's who moves over first. Yeah. And you'd be surprised how often a five-year-old on a bike has to go off to the side because people aren't moving. Yeah, so I, we wait as long as we can. I, I've, I've, I made the joke. Yeah, I said, we used to have childbirth and now we just have wide birth. And, and you, can, <laughs> you can see the psychological phenomena unfolding about, look, at he's a wide birther. Are you yeah. wide birthing me? Are you wide birthing me? But I love the chicken. That's great. Yeah. And we have, and then there's, there's sometimes even, so you have, I mean, I think like typically, you know, social customs is you go to one side and if there's more than one of you, you both go to, to the same side. And we've got couples that are both going on either side of us. And I, we're like, even McKinley's like, why would they do that? And I'm like, I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But that's what we've been doing. Been playing sidewalk chicken and uh, <laughs> keeping going for our walks. Uh, but yeah, oh, that's good. That's same good. old, same old <laughs> coming up next. We get a visit with our middle school teachers, Jackie Demchuk and Kendra Lay, and they take us into the grade seven classroom. We are very happy to welcome two of our middle school faculty to the show. Uh, today, I'd like to welcome Jackie Demchuk and Kendra Lay. Uh, good afternoon. How are you two doing today? Very well, thank you, Brian. Doing well, Brian, thank you. Well, we appreciate your time um, and we're excited to hear about all the great things happening in grade seven. So the first question uh, that I think our listeners would like to would like to know or how have the grade sevens adapted to this shift in online learning and maybe uh, give us a few of the, of the highlights. Um, OK, I'll, I'll start if that's OK, Kendra. Um, yep. We, I have been very impressed with how well the grade sevens have taken to online learning and how well they've adapted and mostly how much they've helped us. <laughs> They've helped us by offering us so much feedback and really positive and, and they've been really great about it, really, really cheerful and using a growth mindset, which is something we talked about a lot in the beginning of the year. So it was, it's been awesome. That's amazing. Yeah, for sure. I, uh, Jackie and I spent a good chunk of the year talking about uh, growth mindset with the girls and they've really modeled those characteristics that we've talked about, resilience and grit and the ability to persevere and pivot. It's been great. Yeah. And any specific highlights, things that maybe have happened? Oh, I'm sure there's lots that have happened, lots of things that have happened that were unexpected, but any anything kind of stick out so far? Highlights for me, I'd have to say, are just seeing the girls. It's so hard to go without seeing them for, you know, a few days. Um, so just the fact that they're showing up, they're excited to be there, they're engaging in discussion. I thrive on that and I'm excited by that. Absolutely. Um, I try and, and get out for exercise when I can. And uh, one of the highlights from that was walking down uh, Amelie's Grandma Street and one of the students jumped out of her house and said, Mrs. Lay. And I was just so excited to see her. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah I Just to jump in here, obviously as two dynamic teachers in middle school, uh, you're pretty used to work in a room and, and reading, reading your audience. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about some of the difficult, you talked about seeing the students. It's nice to connect that way, yeah. but just as far as, as the methodology and being able to watch the eyes open and watch them squint and puzzle. Do uh, you want to talk a little bit about reading the room uh, in the virtual environment? <laughs> well, well, that's uh, really hard now. <laughs> um, and Absolutely. It is. <laughs> it, it really is. And honestly, for me, that is probably the biggest hardship here is I, I knew that I tended to respond to what the room was doing, how they were looking, reading the body language. I knew that about myself. I mean, all teachers do that, right? We, we all are looking for that, you know, confused look and we're living for that, you know, boom, my brain just caught on and my face lights <laughs> up. We live for the confused look. <laughs> yeah, the, the confused look is more like <laughs> So when I see someone's face all scrunched up, I know I can intervene and I can use many, many, many words. I move around a lot and I make faces. And I, for one, am really missing that feedback from the students. I depend a lot on adjusting my instruction from their feedback. And we also solicit a lot of feedback. Like I will say to them directly in class, 
hey, how was that assignment? What did what worked for you? What didn't work for you? And I can tell from looking at them <laughs> that maybe they have a lot to say or a little to say. So that piece of it, I um, so craving seeing their faces and getting that feedback that I'm not getting on a regular basis. Reading the room um, is is a lot more difficult, and I'm depending a lot more on them offering response. And that's not the easiest thing to do it as a just as a human being to offer up your response and be vulnerable. And I've been very impressed with how many students have said, hey, I'm not getting this or I need some extra help either in front of their peers in a group situation or they've solicited uh, help through ch- chat. And it's it's been really wonderful how open they've been to do. Yeah, I think I've I've said to the girls, and I think you were there when I said this, Jackie, it's kind of akin to uh, cooking blindfolded and not having the ability to taste anything. <laughs> yeah, nice metaphor. That, Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. great, great metaphor. Yeah, so I, I, and I've said that to the girls. I said, you know, you really have to rely on them to communicate with you and let you know when things aren't working. And a lot of the times, you know, even this week, I said to them, we're going to try this new app. If it doesn't work, that's okay. We're going to try it and just see and try something new. And and they always welcome the challenge. I was pretty blown away yesterday. I was looking at uh, the app I used yesterday, Actively Learn. And um, they could have a conversation in front of me. I wasn't in that conversation. I wasn't in the chat or anything, but that conversation had unfolded and they did it responsibly. And it was just amazing to see. Yeah, that sounds great. Well, I'll have to check out that app. Uh, what's the name of that again? It's called activelylearn.com. So it's okay. a step up from Edpuzzle. Um, I'm really excited to hear some of these things. I, and the, the metaphor, Kendra, you're going to, I think if it hasn't happened already, the fighter jet is coming. It's gonna be I hope so. bad. <laughs> I just want to thank you guys for joining us today. It was, a, it was really fun to hear about what's happening in grade seven. I really think that um, our students are engaged across the board and the experiences that all of our teachers, including uh, the two of you, are providing an amazing returning a tough situation into into great learning experiences. So I wanted to thank you on behalf of all of our students as well. Yeah, thank, thanks so much for all your hard work and your efforts and really, really nice to have an opportunity to chat with you here today. Well, thank you for having us and uh, I wish the both of you well as, as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. What makes you say that? is a podcast meant to bring people into the BH community. And so one of the things that we thought we would do was to build on something the prefects did, which was uh, learn more about the faculty and staff of Balmoral Hall through trivia games and a Kahoot. Uh, We've also done this a few times at uh, professional development days. We actually put Mrs. Joanne Caymans on the spot and uh, asked her to identify three very very odd facts about uh, about the staff members at Balmoral Hall. And she got all of them immediately. It was very impressive. So today, uh, thrilled to show, I'm going to ask John three questions. I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to provide John with three facts about a staff member at Balmoral Hall, and he's going to have the opportunity to guess. John, are you ready for number one? I'm, I'm ready, Brian. <laughs> so fact number one, this staff or faculty member once played 18 games of cribbage in one night. <laughs> Well, 18 games of cribbage means they must be good at staying up very late. <laughs> do you have a guess? <clears throat> um, I, I, I do, but I, 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 not, not for sure. So I'm not going to, I, I'm going to suggest that they're night owls. <laughs> All right. Well, stay tuned for fact number two. Last week, we discussed a tweet from Edutopia exploring what educators and students should really be focusing on. This week, we have something else to share from Edutopia, an article providing advice to parents who are now trying to help their children learn remotely. The article is called Seven Guiding Principles for Parents Teaching from Home, and it was written by Laura Lee. You can find this article in the show notes, and if it sounds interesting or at all helpful, we encourage you to take a look. The article begins with, Understanding the why behind teaching practices can help parents create meaningful and effective at-home learning opportunities during the pandemic. The article explores 
all seven basic principles and then explains how they are all grounded in research and science. John, let's start by chatting a little bit about encouraging productive struggle. How do you plan for this? Well, I think even before all this happened, I mean, obviously this is some, some real productive struggle, but even before in our, our attitudes towards what we were learning, we, we talk about building prototypes and we talk about taking risks. And as we've mentioned previously, that's a really good opportunity for, for our students to struggle, not, not hopefully emotionally, uh, not with, I but with the challenge of, of learning things, uh, and, and figuring things out. Um, and we talk a lot about moving from a, a grading culture to a learning culture. And I think if you buy in on that and you embrace that, that the idea of productive struggle, you know, struggle doesn't have a real positive connotation, but I think the, pro- the productive part and the encouraged part uh, are the keys there. Yeah, exactly. I think it's important to challenge the students during this time. Um, let's, let's move on to one, another of the principles that was discussed in the article, and that is consolidating learning. There are a few ways to go about this. Uh, where have you gone with this? Well, I, I, this is an additional challenge, right? I, I mean, often schools and teachers use different types of assessments to help consolidate learning. Uh, and in the online environment, this, this really takes on a whole, whole different re, a resonance. Um, so I think it's really important that in the context of, of the, the unit, wherever you find yourself, that conversations happen about what are you learning? Why are you learning? I also think that the emphasis on enduring understandings and, and big picture ideas are really helpful. And that's something uh, we've tried to emphasize in our teaching prior to this. Yeah. And one of the examples the article suggests was having students teach what they learn to someone else. And so parents can use that too. They call it the protege effect. And they say it's effective because teaching something requires that you have a firm grasp on the topic, as we all know. (laughs) Yeah. Even Uh, if you don't find that your younger brother being better at French is helpful. (laughs) He he does have something to say. Uh, What about checking in? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is the most important part, I think, of what we do. Um, My mom, before I ever taught a day, said, don't worry about it too much. They're not going to remember what you teach them anyway. (laughs) 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 To be a cynic. But she did say, they're going to remember how you made them feel. Right. And so I know when we're working together, we spend we spend a great deal of time checking in with students, uh, building and fostering those relationships. And and, I mean, you, you know how important it is. Yeah, we use this in our classes every day, every single day. Uh, back to the article, it also mentions frequent brain breaks for students, and it also says to consider passions and play. Have these worked for you so far? Or how have you kind of uh, embedded these ideas? Yeah. Um, as an English teacher, I always joke that I have two jobs. One of them's teaching and the other one's marking. And, and marking, of course, is, is probably the bane of many, many a teacher's existence. And so you develop all kinds of strategies to try to get through a weekend of, you know, 40 papers or 80 papers or whatever it is that you have sitting in front of you. And so the only way I've figured out how to do that piles of five and the reward is 10 minutes of piano after a pile of five. Um, and so in this case, just to get away from the screen and, and uh, that's what I'm doing for sure. And, and encouraging and, my kids to do the same. Yeah. So if a teacher needs a brain break, you could imagine um, uh, the students. And so the article does discuss some limits uh, in terms of minutes uh, spent on tasks that I think uh, the parents might find helpful. Uh, finding a rhythm that works for students seems obvious. So there's a lot of schedules out there claiming to be the best to follow, but research suggests it might not be that simple. The article used Daniel Pink's ideas that some students are larks and some students are owls. How should parents interpret this? Yeah, well, we, we've talked about scheduling and the importance of scheduling, but uh, I know I, I shouldn't speak for Christine, but she kind of wants everything done by one o'clock or by four o'clock. And of course, sometimes it just doesn't work that way. And I think being sensitive to when you're feeling productive, um, you know, if, if mornings are working, I definitely encourage morning. And if, 
you want to work in the evening or the late afternoon, then I, yeah, it's super important to find out what works for you. I think pinks, uh, I love the idea of the lark and the, and the, the imagery there. So, but yeah, schedules you, are still important. <laughs> you, you love a metaphor. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> finally, the final principle um, listed was establishing a flexible learning space. Now, this to me sounds a lot like students and parents should spend each uh, sometime each week building forts. Is that is that true or? Well, I, I know that when we've traveled together, I always think we should turn one room into the fort room. <laughs> um, but I, I got to say that. This, this is something for me, even as my house becomes my place of work and as my house becomes my place of learning, uh, we've pulled desks up from the basement. We've moved tables down to create, you know, the, the drone and R, RC repair shop. Uh, <laughs> the dining room table has become uh, a grade one classroom. The spare bedroom has become, uh, as I said, my gentleman's cavern. Uh, but yeah, we're definitely learning about flexible learning spaces. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's super important, I think, just to roll with it. <laughs> you want to build a fort, build a fort. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So if you're looking for ideas how to help your daughter learn from home, please, please feel free to check out the link in the show notes uh, to read the full article. If everything is already going well at home without using any of the principles discussed in this segment, then please carry on and don't change a thing. But we do hope lis listening to this segment will give everyone something to think about and perhaps even something to try. Okay, John, we're back with the BH staff trivia game. I've already given you one fact. I'm going to add to that. Fact number two, this staff or faculty member volunteers with the Bear Clan Patrol and Silo Mission. I, yeah, I, I know now. Yeah. What is your guess? My, my guess is uh, our illustrious registrar, uh, Ms. Denise Garapy. Absolutely correct, Mr. John Kerr. With the answer, Miss Garapy, Miss Denise Garapy, our the Balmoral Hall School Registrar. Yeah, and I, I've had the pleasure of uh, having lunch with Miss Garapy for sixteen of those thirty years. So I, I, I would really like to get back to the lunch club, as we call it. So a shout out to the lunch club. All right, John Gold Star, you win this round. Coming up next, we'll be joined by Balmoral Hall School's Director of Innovation and Technology, Ms. Lois McGill. We are happy to be joined now by the Director of Innovation and Technology of Balmoral Hall School, Ms. Lois McGill. Welcome to What Makes You Say That, Lois? Thanks, I'm really glad to be here. So obviously there's lots going on, and as the Director of Innovation and Technology, can you tell us a little bit about how BH is using the Center for Arts and Design to help fight COVID-19? Yeah, it's been really quite exciting. And uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to involve the students just with our um, physical distancing not, protocols yeah. that we have, right? But uh, with the uh, new Trotec laser cutter, uh, we have been able to produce some medical face shields that uh, actually are going out this week. Oh, that's um, great. Lots of, lots of schools have been able to help with 3D printing, but because we have the laser cutter, we've been able to produce them quite quickly because it does a much faster, much cleaner job. So with the help of uh, Kirsten Osborne and Dave Zimmerman, we've been able to um, create several with a small donation that we had. And what we've learned today from the uh, person who is picking up the face shields is that we, they could use a lot more. So hopefully we can roll out more in the weeks to come. Oh, that sounds amazing. That's great. And I think we'll have that ability to do that. Um, and it would be, you know, even more exciting if the students uh, were able to help out. And obviously that's, that's not the case right now. Um, no, but you know what? It's really given us, uh, it's really opened our eyes to the potential that we could have once we get the girls back, right? Uh, ways to help the community in, in ways that really aren't academic, but just would really be able to help our our health facilities and, and other people. So uh, we've learned a lot in the last uh, couple of weeks. I, I think it's a good example of how working and learning environments are, are melding uh, more naturally. Uh, and, and as you say, uh, it shows us the potential of using that kind of space and the equipment when we do have students back in the building. Yeah, that's well, and it, did, it was without hesitation that this organization in the medical field 
uh, look to K-12 school for support in this. It was not that we needed to be a manufacturer. Like they had that trust that what we could do was top quality and delivered in time. That was that was kind of a really neat thing to see that it was like, thanks for your help. We really appreciate it. And we're, we're coming back for more. Well, that sounds amazing. Uh, so much, uh, so much is changing in, in all of our lives. And I think education also is undergoing a, you know, a, well, certainly the conditions right now have changed for us, but how do you think remote learning now is going to leave its mark on education even when we return? Well, just as a side note, there'll never be another snow day ever again. Um, <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so get ready. Yeah. Um, it, it's really interesting what's going on. People talk about this new normal and in lots of uh, webinars and conversations I've had with educational people all around the world that this new normal could be that we need to get used to disruption. This pandemic is just one of many situations that could occur coming up, whether it's hate to say it, terrorism, it could be a fire, it could be floods, like look at Australia with their fires, right, where schools disrupted. We probably need to get ourselves and our students used to the fact that um, we could be very quickly alternating between face-to-face -face and online learning, much of a blended approach, that that's not the unusual uh, situation that's going to happen. That's going to be the situation that's going to happen. If it's Yeah, it was one of our check-in questions this week, actually. What would you do differently next time? <laughs> exactly. Hoping, hoping exactly. there isn't a, hoping there isn't a next time uh, right away. But uh, just before we go, uh, one other thing that that came from the school uh, communications was the BH Remote Learning Hub. Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? You know, we through all of this, we've learned a lot of things, and it was only because of the willingness of the worldwide educational community to help each other and not hide resources behind a wall. So what we wanted to also do was be able to provide as many things out there, uh, there were a lot of schools that were struggling. Uh, we're fortunate that most of our kids um, have access to technology, have access to great Wi-Fi. So the fact that we could provide some things that maybe they didn't have time to look for. So we put those things out there on the hub for our parents, for our, uh, our, our, our greater community to be able to access at a glance. Because what we've learned through all of this is that online learning isn't about the technology, but online learning is very human. You know, the human factor is something that we really have to pay attention to. And as we go further in this journey, because we know it's going to not end. Yeah, I, I think that is a concern, right, is that the balance of of wellness. And I, I know that you, you're pretty accustomed to being in front of your computer all day. Um, but I know even just wearing headphones, uh, changes that and you know watching these young kids sitting in front of screens more and more there there are a number of considerations aren't there oh that's so true john right because what we're doing right now is not really online learning it's just in response to this crisis and this pandemic we're dealing with so many social and emotional issues right now that if we were if it was a true online environment those those issues wouldn't be there yeah i think uh, relationships and interactions and that connection is is very important and so we certainly thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us uh, and discuss that with, uh, with us today hopefully you are willing to come back on and give us further updates uh, as we move forward but thank you very much for joining us yeah thanks for uh, your thanks time. for having me thank you talk to you guys soon Roast the host. So last week we started a brand new segment called Roast the Host, and the score after one week is Mr. Williams won, Mr. Kerr no score. However, upon further review, John reviewed the video of my answer, and I think John, you're saying that you'd prefer to take that point away. Well, I, I want our listeners to imagine that the refs have gathered in the referee crease. <laughs> They're looking at the tablet. They've got the headset on. And uh, to, to refresh our memories, your answer about the importance of the beaver was that it was a fashion style which allowed the fur trade to develop. And I quote, and the la it allowed the land to be explored. And after further review, I kind of thought I, you, did, you did say you, you didn't have time to write an essay. 
But I, I thought did, I did say that, yes. that you might allude to, you know, political systems, the birth and death of languages, the relationships between people and personalities. I just thought there was so, so much more you could have done. But you did mention fashion. So that, that, <laughs> that's uh, OK. I don't that's know what the ref's going to say when he comes back to center ice. <laughs> we should at least take a look at it. Well, you know what? I think based on the level of difficulty of my question to you, I, I think the refs will, will wave it off. So we'll go at zero, zero. So why don't you send me this week's question and I'll try to, I'll try to get a point this week. Yeah, for sure. So this week's question, keeping with hockey. Uh, there is an article in the paper this week about the NHL looking at using hub cities and maybe playing through the summer months. And I know that we talked to a lot of students who are missing sports and I know that you're a huge hockey fan and a, and a great coach. And so that's my question to you today. What do you make of the NHL looking to award a Stanley cup for the 2019, 2020 season? <laughs> oh, well, I think, I mean, this will be hard to, to grade and earn a point too, but uh, I think the way it works it all comes down to the borders and whether or not people can travel across international borders with most of, not most, with so many NHLers being in Europe um, and, and, in, and in multiple countries, uh, both here in North America and overseas. Um, I think that the NHL will do everything that it can to play the Stanley Cup playoffs in July and August. I truly believe that if there's a way, they'll do it with empty stands. But I, it, I, everything comes back to whether those governments the government of all these countries open the borders. So I don't know if that scores. That is my take. Well, yeah, I, I, I think this might be one of those questions that the point might be held until we see what happens. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> well, so my we'll, answer is, we'll my answer is August. Yeah. yeah, I like that. So my answer is yes. Okay. Yeah. So for you, John, I'm just going to stick with Shakespeare. I'm going to give you an, an opportunity to, um, you know, all of the listeners and all of the response from episode two, everybody was shocked that you met. No, just kidding. No one said anything, but I was surprised. So here we go. What is the last word in Shakespeare's Hamlet? Uh, bid the soldier shoot. Uh, so... <laughs> hope, hopefully my yeah hopefully my research is not correct or is correct from what i hear it looks like the last sentence is the rest is silence oh that that's yeah I it think. depends on whether fortune brass makes <laughs> uh, makes the appearance because sometimes fortune brass doesn't make the appearance in act five but uh all right, so the last word on the record is silence. Uh, so we're going to hold this one too. So <laughs> we're still at zero, zero. Nobody's right. Nobody's wrong. Uh, that's it for Roast the Host. We're joined now by Irina Zanamorowski, Ballader Househead. Go Ballader! Welcome to the show, Irina. Why don't we talk about what you sent out to, to all staff and all students was this really fun BH faculty Kahoot. Where did the idea come from? Uh, and what is it all about? For sure. So it actually has, I think it has quite an interesting uh, origin. So it was when we were back at school in, at the beginning of March, I think, I was waiting for a CLS meeting after school, um, just standing on the third floor, right? And Ms. Kirk comes out and she's like, oh, I just finished our chem exam, like your chem exam. It's so easy. It only took me I think she would have said like 45 minutes of the hour or whatever. And I wasn't too pleased. So I told her that and I was like, okay, well, you've done chem and you have like your degrees in chem or whatever. So I'd hope that you find it um, somewhat <laughs> easy. And then she looked at me and she's like, well, yeah, but like, I do know chem, but I didn't like my degree isn't in chem. And I was like, hmm? and then I questioned, I was like, wait a minute, do you like, are you qualified to be teaching us chemistry? Cause I was a little all over the place at that. Of course, point. of course you'd ask me. <laughs> Yeah, of course I did. I have like typical me. But then she said, yes, I know chemistry, but my degree was in math. Like I'm a math major. And I was very shocked by that. And then I took it upon myself to go and ask every other teacher on the third floor what their major was, because I was like, wait a minute, like, am I being deceived by every single teacher in this building? And then I went to ask <laughs> Ms. Briggs and she was like, oh yeah, like I'm not a biology major either. Like I started in sciences and like teaching sciences. And I was like, wait, what? So 
I knew that Dr. Mitchler took physics. That's the one thing that I was like certain on. And I was like, okay, we've got one that I know. But then when quarantine started and um, Mrs. Green was like asking us to come up with ideas for how to keep like the student body engaged and whatnot, because our spirit week had been canceled and a lot of the other activities that we were looking forward to, we couldn't do. So I, I'm pretty sure it was like at like 6.30 in the morning one day, I sent a giant text to our group chat and I was like, guys, I have this great idea. We should do a Kahoot about what you don't know about your teachers. This idea came and then I told them about um, like the Ms. Kirk thing and people like loved the idea and they're like, yes, let's do this. Let's put it together. And I was super enthusiastic. I was like, we can have this out on Friday because this was before spring break. And they were like, no, 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 calm down. Like for, we might be in quarantine for a while. Let's do this. Let's make this a big thing. Do it later. So I emailed all the teachers. They, we had fantastic turnout. Like in total, I have 73 questions, which means that there was like 36.5 teachers, but there actually weren't. Because <laughs> each teacher sent two, but some teachers sent me like five or six facts. That was really awesome. Thank you, Ms. LePage and Mr. McPherson. You, yeah, I learned a lot about you. That was pretty awesome. <laughs> so Putting, I was putting it together over spring break. We sent it out. We did some trial runs with the prefects. It was great. And then now we have three weeks of Kahoot going. So there was one. There's one coming out. Well, I guess by the time that they'll be hearing this, there's the second one. And then there's one more. Irina, are, yes. are you able to track uh, which schools and which houses are, are, are playing along? <laughs> Oh, I know where this is. Well, <laughs> well, as I asked very politely in my email for people to please put their name as their username, so A, we can identify the winners, but also we can find out what house they're in because I'm not sure if we mentioned this already, but at the end, we're going to look at the top four players and we're going to give um, just our standard house points, like 175, 50, 25 to each of their houses. So yes, we can identify if they put their names, um, but if they didn't, then it's going to Ballader. Yeah, that is yeah, going to say. Of course it is. Defaults to Ballader. Yeah, defaults right? to Ballader. Yeah, or I like if I were to do the Kahoot, I would get 100% because I made it. So yeah, then I'd I'm be gonna, in yeah. first place. I'm going to be looking into these results very carefully, making sure Braemar does not get um, does not get pushed aside here. So uh, tell me, other than the degrees and, and your, your teacher's schooling, what did you learn about your teachers that you were you know, maybe shocked about? Or what were some of your favorite things that came up that you would have never believed? Um, actually, I was pretty much surprised by every single teacher that sent me um, like facts about themselves. Some I think were a bit more expected than others. Like I was like, okay, I could see you doing this or see you having done this at one point, but others I did not expect at all, or I didn't know why. I got a lot of degrees. I've learned that there's a lot of biology and math majors in our building. So <laughs> that's pretty cool. I didn't know that. I was surprised by um, Madame Delaney's actually. I thought that was so cool how she was a translator at the Olympics. Yes, very cool. Oh, wow, yes, that exciting. must have been incredible. And um, also, Ms. Caustic, how she's a, how she was like trained to be a paramedic. That was like really interesting. I don't know. Um, on a, along a similar line with Mr. Solinsky, how he was accepted into the RCMP and teaching at the same time. I didn't know that. And I thought that was really interesting. And it's really interesting to see how I think the school talks a lot about how the student body has many interests and diverse interests or whatnot. Um, but I think having seen all the teachers that sent me their information, like their facts, I really got to see that like our, the teachers and the staff, they're like that too. So it's really yeah, cool. That we do have lives, uh, sometimes <laughs> not anymore, but we used to be when we were allowed to be, we actually are in public sometimes. And I know that shocks some <laughs> students. Uh, well, you know what? Um, I'm sure there's a few other things, but hey, keep up the great work. The prefects are doing an amazing job keeping us together, uh, staying connected. The Kahoot was, uh, can I say it, was a hoot. Um, I, hopefully there, if there's a bad dad joke, uh, like sound, I think it should be played, but thank you very much, Irina, for all your hard work. And of course, for joining us today. Yeah. Nice to chat with thank you. you. Thank you. As we prepare to close the show, we have heard from the video officials on the review of Mr. Kerr of John's answer. And there was a technical difficulty with the question. And in fact, John 
does earn the point. He was correct. A good goal. As we end episode three, we'd like to thank our guests for taking the time to chat with us. Uh, Jackie Demchuk and Kendra Lay for bringing us into the middle school classrooms uh, specifically grade seven. Thank you also to Miss Lois McGill for highlighting the technology being used to help our students continue learning away from the school and for shining some light on the laser cutter being used to make masks uh, in the fight against COVID-19, which was amazing to hear. Thanks as always to Mr. John Kerr for his insight, the laughs and the company. It's always fun. Yep. Take care, everyone. And a big thanks to producer Chris in the booth for always taking care of us and for reviewing answers and for everything else. We'll be back again next week with episode four with a science themed show. We'll be talking to Miss Jennifer Kirk about teaching science online and how it's so much different than in the labs at BH. And we also have an exciting chat with epidemiologist and current BH parent Cynthia Carr about the COVID-19 pandemic and what it means for all of us moving forward. That that? and more metaphors, stories, and fun. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, friends. Hi, folks. What Makes You Say That is a Balmoral Hall School production, all rights reserved.